Hello and welcome. This video is about HIV in pregnancy. As you may be aware, HIV remains a major global public health issue and some countries are reporting increasing trends in new infections. There is no cure for HIV infection. However, with the access to effective HIV prevention and treatment, HIV infection has become a manageable chronic health condition, enabling people who have HIV to lead long and healthy lives. The World Health Organization, the Global Fund, and all other UN agencies are aligned with the target to end HIV epidemic by the year 2030. We will be covering some learning objectives in this video, which include knowing who are the at-risk population, if a husband or a wife or both are positive, then how to plan for pregnancy? What is the meaning of PrEP in the management of HIV? What is the risk of HIV during pregnancy and labor? What is patient safety during labor? How to manage the labor of pregnant patient and the newborn? What is the a kind of education that is to be provided to patients and to their families. What are the important points in history and, and physical examination? What investigations should be sent in HIV patients? Should we screen all pregnant patients for HIV? Or should, is there a at-risk population? And should we vaccinate patients in, when they have HIV? And what kind of vaccinations can be given? So, so in our country, the main risk populations are people who inject drugs, people who are sex workers, whether they are men or women, transgender sex workers, or men who have sex with men, unsafe blood transfusions and reuse of needles. So these risk factors are very much the same as those all over the world. This is a very eye-opening and reliable, even though a very old publication, which shows that women are much more prone to acquiring HIV as compared to men when couples have stable relationships. So the next question is that if a woman approaches you and asks you about planning her pregnancy and she has HIV, then what kind of information and what kind of education and precautions should be provided? So when a woman with HIV wants to have a baby, she may have delay in conceiving. If she and her husband want to attempt natural conception, then she must undergo treatment first to suppress viral load. When the viral load has been reduced, the couple can try for pregnancy over a six month period. This means that during this time period, they can have protected intercourse, but during the ovulatory period, they are allowed two acts of unprotected intercourse. And this can take place over a six month period. So even though the attempts for fertilization and impregnation are limited, but with each attempt, the risk of sexual transmission must be considered even in the presence of an undetectable viral load. The couple always have an alternative option to have assisted insemination with the partner's semen. So how would you approach the situation if a couple want to achieve pregnancy and the husband or the male partner is affected? If the husband is infected with HIV, then natural conception carries a risk of transmission to the uninfected female. And therefore, alternatives to natural conception are the safest options. 
In the first instance, the husband should have treatment to suppress viral load and the couple is counseled to identify any or other risk factors such as associated sexually transmitted diseases. Semen washing can be considered with appropriate counseling as it may decrease the HIV, RNA and DNA to undetectable levels after processing and rechecking for residual contamination. The spermatozoa can be used for intrauterine insemination or in vitro fertilization. Even after sperm washing and reduction of viral load in the husband, the risk of HIV transmission to the wife is not eliminated entirely. So what are the alternative options? These include either adoption or sperm donation with assisted reproduction techniques. In the third situation, we can have a couple who want to achieve pregnancy and the husband and the wife are both carrying the virus. In this situation, if the husband and the wife are having natural intercourse without any contraception, then they are not increasing the risk for either partner. However, if the couple is planning pregnancy, then both partners should attain maximum viral suppression and be screened and treated for genital tract infections before attempting conception. This is according to the principle that the husband and the wife should be in their optimal health when they start trying for a pregnancy as disease conditions may further influence an adverse outcome in the pregnancy. So apart from the information provided about pregnancy, you should also know about the WHO guidance for PrEP in zero discordant couples who have sexual activity with each other. So because of the risk involved in transmission of infection and because overall the objective of all kinds of management and all kinds of public health programs is to prevent transmission, the World Health Organization has released very important recommendation for sexual activity in zero discordant couples. So zero discordant couple means that one partner has HIV positive and the other partner is either negative or it is unknown that she is negative or he is negative or positive. So if the couples want to have unprotected sex, then they must take PrEP medication for lifetime. These recommendations have been developed specifically to address the daily use of antiretrovirals in HIV uninfected people to block the acquisition of HIV infection. And this preventive approach is known as pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP. At this stage, evidence is available from studies with two groups, either men and transgender women who have sex with men. Here, the person taking the PrEP is the one who is non-infected and is trying to prevent infection or zero discordant heterosexual couples. What about a couple who want to plan for pregnancy? What kind of advice can be given to them about pregnancy and their HIV status? First of all, women who are HIV positive may have delay in achieving fertility and may require some help for achieving infertility. If a woman has HIV, then becoming pregnant will not influence the progression of the HIV disease in that particular patient. Furthermore, pregnancy does not seem to affect the survival of women who are infected with 
HIV. What kind of family education or patient education should be provided to patients? It's very critical to advise couples about family planning services so that they can plan their pregnancies to achieve the best possible outcome for the newborn. And also it is important to find out about, about other diseases that may be present and for optimizing the health status. So that means they have to go to a family medicine clinic or to a HIV clinic to find out if they have any other medical problems. It's also important to find out their status with regard to HIV infection and to find out what is their viral load so that they can have proper suppression of the virus levels in their blood for the purpose of achieving pregnancy in a healthy status. It is also important for, for, for people to realize that HIV is a lifelong disease and even when their viral loads are suppressed, they still need to continue their medication for lifelong. The lower the viral load, the lower the risk of progression of the disease into much more serious conditions. Additional smoking or drugs and unprotected intercourse have been associated with the increased risk of perinatal transmission. What points will you cover when you take the history of a patient who has HIV infection and is either planning pregnancy or is pregnant? In pregnancy, the initial history should assess the status of the patient's HIV disease, that is the viral load, the CD4 levels, T cell count. The need for beginning or altering antiretroviral medication and ways to reduce perinatal transmission. All patients who have HIV and are pregnant must have recommendation for starting treatment with infectious disease specialist and if they are already having treatment with an infectious disease specialist to renew their clinical contact with them. A careful review of the medical and the surgical history, the gynecological history, high-risk habits and previous obstetric history should be taken at the first prenatal visit. Women have to be screened clinically for current and past exposure to intimate partner violence and depression and referrals should be made to supportive and mental health services if these are present and if it is indicated. As far as physical examination is concerned, during pregnancy, a complete physical examination must be performed. <clears throat> so as we know about the normal physiological changes, it is important to differentiate from disease process and as HIV infection can affect essentially all body systems, so all body systems must be examined to make sure that there is no liver involvement, no mass in the, in the abdomen, and the chest is clear, there's no evidence of any pneumonitis or any pneumonia. One important question that can present itself is that should all women be screened for HIV status when they come for their pregnancy um, registration or when they come in labor? So we have some recommendations from the World Health Organization who recommend that women who are at risk of developing HIV should be screened. So these are women who are the at-risk groups so when women who are living in areas where there is a very high level of uh, HIV infection, women who've had blood transfusions in an area where blood transfusion is carrying a risk, women who are drug users or abusers, women who are commercial sex workers or their husbands have, um, have uh, uh, lifestyle habits which make them more conducive for having HIV status. So these are the at-risk population. So they recommend that all these women should then be screened for HIV. 
The American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists recommends routine HIV screening for women aged 19 to 64 years and targeted clinic screening for at-risk women outside of this age reference. All pregnant women should have their HIV zero status evaluated when they first present for prenatal care. This is why any patient who is traveling to the United States should have an HIV serology performed. And if they don't have it performed here, then they will have it performed when they reach the United States. In the United Kingdom, universal screening is only recommended for those women who are attending or those men who are attending genital urinary medicine or sexual health clinic, those women who are attending antenatal care, women who present for termination of pregnancy, women who have drug dependency programs, and women who are in healthcare services after diagnosis with tuberculosis, with hepatitis B, with hepatitis C, and with lymphoma. The next question is, what laboratory testing should we do for HIV? So screening for HIV is done by the ELISA test, and this has got a very high sensitivity of 98 to 99%. But subsequent to this, if a diagnostic test needs to be done, then the triple antibody sandwich ELISA test is done. And so if you want to have a patient tested for HIV, you can just ask for HIV serology, and this would include all this testing. Once the diagnosis is confirmed, then viral load is checked through PCR, HIV test. And if the load is too high, then you can also check for AIDS. AIDS or acquired immune deficiency syndrome is a clinical diagnosis. But if the CD4 cell levels are very high, then the person has AIDS, even if it is not clinically obvious. Continued assessment of the HIV status is important, and that is why these patients have to be checked again and again for viral load. In addition to the viral cytology and the testing for viral load and the testing for the AIDS status, Additional testing is also required for each patient that is diagnosed with HIV. And these tests include the following. Blood counts for CBC and for CD4, viral load determined by plasma with PCR. The viral load is important in decisions regarding maternal treatment and delivery management. The treatment decisions will be made by the infectious disease physician. Lipid profile baseline values as certain medications have been associated with increased triglyceride and cholesterol levels. Obstetric ultrasonography viability and dating is important for determining the treatment and for planning delivery. In addition to the above, you need to do hepatitis B surface antigen testing. And if they are negative, then give the hepatitis B vaccine series, hepatitis C virus, also has to be tested as high levels increase the risk of transmission, tuberculosis testing and a chest x-ray with shielding of the abdomen, screening for sexually transmitted diseases and check for vulval and vaginal warts and do a pap smear. So very extensive uh, laboratory screening is required in patients who are diagnosed to have HIV and this is in addition to their testing for obstetric reasons. Are there any vaccinations which can be given to HIV positive women? And uh, if they are, even if they are pregnant, then um, we can uh, administer vaccines even during pregnancy, but we have to avoid giving live attenuated vaccines, which includes measles, mumps, rubella, varicella, and the and Vasil Calmet Guerrel vaccine, which is the BCG. Following vaccines have to be given as a routine. Influenza vaccine, tetanus vaccine, hepatitis A and B vaccines if they are non-immune, and pneumococcal vaccine. So the care of the positive patient in the labor room is very critical to ensure that the patient infection is not transmitted to any of the health care providers. And for this, I will refer you to the uh, detailed video on patient safety in the labor room, but the 
infection control policies and procedures apply very rigorously in such patients. So the British guidelines on management of HIV in pregnancy and postpartum were released in March 2019. And these uh, are generally followed in the United Kingdom as well as in our country. And these guidelines uh, focus on the uh, evaluation of the CD4 cell count in the pregnant woman, as well as on the, the presence of the viral load and starting treatment, performing liver function tests regularly before starting treatment and continuing treatment in those cases where the HIV viral load is high. Apart from that, the obstetric management is also um, uh, recommended in the BIVA guidelines. And uh, the first part of the guideline is on combined testing for fetal aneuploidies and non-invasive prenatal testing for those who screen at high risk. So we cannot perform any invasive prenatal diagnostic testing until the HIV status is known in terms of the viral load, because obviously if the viral load is high, then invasive prenatal diagnostic testing will increase the transmission risk to the fetus. Invasive prenatal testing should be delayed until the viral load has been known and it is suppressed to less than 50 HIV RNA copies per ml of blood. If invasive prenatal testing cannot be delayed until viral suppression is attained, then women should start continuous antiretroviral treatment and include a single dose of nevipramine at 24 to 4 hours before the procedure. So this can only be done after consultation with an infectious disease person. And so the, the, the bottom line for this kind of uh, management is that no invasive testing can be performed in patients unless and until we know their viral load and unless and until we have an infectious disease specialist on board. Elective cesarean section or pre-labor cesarean section can be planned even if the viral load is low, less than 50 HIV RNA copies, in case there are obstetric complications or obstetric indications, and it should be performed between 38 and 39 weeks. In case a patient presents with spontaneous structure of membranes, then the delivery should take place within 24 hours to reduce the risk of transmission. A cesarean section should occur between 39 and 38 weeks when it is indicated for prevention of vertical transmission. So in those cases where the viral load is extremely low, less than 50 HIV RNA copies, a vaginal delivery can also be present. In those cases where the viral load is high, how will we manage the patient? Pre-labor cesarean section can be considered for those with plasma viral load of 50 to 399 HIV RNA copies per ml at 36 weeks in consideration of future viral load, the time of treatment and obstetric and patient factors. Pre-labor cesarean section is also recommended with a viral load of greater than 400 at 36 weeks. What are the guidelines if the patient presents with spontaneous rupture of membrane and she is term pregnancy? The immediate augmentation or induction of labor is recommended if the patient's HIV viral load is low, less than 50. Immediate cesarean section is indicated if the patient has a viral load of greater than 50, which may be 399 or even more than that. What are the guidelines if the patient presents with preterm labor and spontaneous structure of membrane? Again, if the, uh, if the, uh, the viral load is greater than 1000, then you have to start uh, intravenous antiretroviral treatment and uh, 
and uh, and then start planning the delivery. For the sake of delivery, intramuscular steroids can be given along with the antiretroviral treatment and the discussion about the timing and the mode of delivery is recommended when premature spontaneous structure of membrane happens at less than 34 weeks. So the basic principles of management are the same, but the management of the labor itself depends upon the viral load. So remember that if the patient has a low, vagin low viral load, then you can plan a vaginal delivery for such patients after 36 weeks of gestation without any contraindications. As soon as the baby is born, the barrier precautions should be used when handling the baby and single use items should be used and disposed with care. The pediatrician should be present and should have been informed prior to the delivery and the newborn is given treatment according to the HIV association guidelines. So in the postpartum period, according to the guidelines, lactation needs to be suppressed for women who are not breastfeeding by choice or because they have a high viral load. And if they are already on treatment, then this treatment should continue in postpartum period. And it's important to assess the patient, patient's general health as well as the mental health and for referral for appropriate services. And the HIV testing has to be scheduled after delivery and three months after the delivery, patient should also have a pap smear. With this, we come to the end of our video. If you like the video, please subscribe, like, comment, share, and press the bell icon for notification of future videos. Thank you and goodbye.